So, for the last two and a half years, I've written a daily column about race in America. Now, as fun as that sounds, I'm going to start us off today with a story about fishing. Trust me, I can defend this. So I've been fly fishing for about 10 years now, and I can tell you it's the thing that brings me the most joy of anything in my life outside of my family, and it has really changed me. So here's the thing about fly fishing is that it's really just a trick. It is your job to trick the fish by giving them an imitation of a bug that they will think is real and is delicious and is exactly what they want to eat at that moment in time. And it is harder than it sounds because the trout also have another job, which is not to fall for it. And they're very good at it, and they're very good at staying alive. As you can imagine, it's not a volume business. It's a nerd's game, and it's an endless puzzle, and technique is everything. But the other great thing about it is that you get to learn a lot. You get to learn about um, air pressure and knots and water flow and snow melt, and you follow the mating habits of bugs like your paparazzi chasing Kardashians, and how climate change is now allowing bark beetles to um, survive increasingly warming winters and destroy ponderosa pines in unprecedented acres across the West. Ponderosa pines smell like vanilla cake. Not vanilla, not cake, but vanilla cake. And I love knowing that. I also love to knowing that you have to hug them in order to really get the smell. But every year I go back to Montana, and I see these beautiful trees dying off in record numbers. And I think now they just look like fuel. Now, I even have a favorite trout. That's how good I am. I don't mean like a species of trout, like an actual dude, like this big trout <laughs> who lives under this, under this really small bridge in this tiny part of Rock Creek in Montana. And I've been chasing it for years. And I know eventually I'm going to trick him. And when I do, I'm going to let them go, because that's what we do. We let them go. It's such a privilege to be part of something bigger than myself. So as a quasi-cynical girl from Harlem, USA, I never knew anybody who fished like this, and I never thought that I would. Um, but for people like me, it changes you in a way that you don't expect to join an ecosystem already in progress. It's um, a beautiful thing that humans don't often get to do. I know I certainly did. So here's the other thing about fly fishing. I have never met a person of color on or associated with the river. Never once, not in 10 years. Not a guide, not a park ranger, nobody works for a rafting company, no expert on YouTube, where I get most of my tips. Occasionally, I'll run into a woman on the river, um, but it's not like, there's a sisterhood of the traveling waiters, and we instantly bond and start dancing. We're just doing our thing out there. Once, once I saw a black man in a little tiny brew pub in a very small rural part of Montana, and we met eyes, and I assure you 100% we both thought the other one was in witness protection. <laughs> now, on one level, this is normal to me, right? I'm used to being the only one. We're close to it. My Mom's family is white. I went to a predominantly white college in um, my crazy career, which brought me here to you today in the arts, a little bit in venture capital. And yeah, in journalism. I'm good at it. Like people like me, I've gotten good at navigating cultures, um, making the best possible career moves, and navigating bad advice about my hair, about my career options, and sharing some pretty good advice about how to trick the one manager who only hires the kind of guys that we know they hire, that your idea is his idea, so at least you can get some work done. But here's the real thing about fly fishing. Popul people of color are lonely by design. And I'll tell you, being um, the only one in the river is a lonely bit of business, even though natural parks are, um, solitude is part of the point. The national park system, and it's which turned 100 in 2016, and it's absolutely beautiful out there, is um, partly the creation of a romantic and dedicated 19th century naturalist that most of us have heard of and everybody loves named John Muir. He was a beautiful guy, and it's beautiful out there, and I actually took that picture of that moose. But the National Park System, which turned 100 in 2016, is also the creation of another guy, a zoologist, a conservationist, and a white supremacist named Madison Grant. Now, Grant wrote an immensely popular book called the Passing of the Great Race. And it's a breathtakingly racist work that was incredibly popular when it was published in 1916. And it armed generations of leaders for years with enough pseudoscience to justify 
segregation, eugenics, race war, workplace discrimination, and the violent oppression of inferior, inferior races. So he went to Yale and he went to Columbia and he hung out with really fancy people like future President Teddy Roosevelt who loved the book so much he even wrote a blurb for it. And he was super influential. If you like the Bronx Zoo in New York, then you can thank Madison Grant. If you like Yellowstone Park, you can thank Madison Grant. And if you think that immigrants are filthy criminals who are bringing in diseases and doing a lot of raping, then Madison Grant is also part of the reason why. Grant and his many friends thought the National Park should be a respite for manly white men who needed to refresh their spirits in the face of this threat to their race. And remember, Jim Crow was in full swing and the Great Migration was happening, which really was the escape of desperate people from the racial caste system of the segregated South. A hundred years later, the destination cities of the Great Migration, like Chicago and Baltimore and St. Louis, where I now live, are still reckoning with the aftermath of this thinking. And a hundred years later, people of color are still feeling unwelcome even in the cultivated outdoors of the golf courses and the tennis clubs where business has traditionally been done. So even though we don't know his name, the ghost of Madison Grant and his friends haunt us all. So if my father was alive today, a man born to a single mom who knew former slaves, who witnessed lynching, who served in World War II in the segregated army, came home to South Carolina and couldn't vote, and who also couldn't get a special mortgage for veterans, thanks to Teddy Roosevelt's cousin Franklin, and who managed to migrate his way up to Harlem anyway and get a great job as a social worker, and who as a lifelong renter was able to pass on no generational wealth to his one and only daughter, except for his social security survivor benefits. If my father was alive today and he just heard me tell you that I spend my free time standing in Madison Grant's America, standing in a river trying to trick some damn fish, I honestly don't know what he would say. History is such a weird thing. But he might say something like, you better hope that sound that's coming up behind you is a grizzly bear. So I love the National Park Service. That's me, I love trout. <laughs> You're probably not supposed to kiss them. <laughs> and I love that they've spent millions of dollars trying to reckon with their difficult past to make nature more welcoming. Their diversity report is not good, nobody's is. They know that they have work to do. And there's always a question that comes up everywhere, no matter where you come in on this, about whether it's important to dig into Madison Grant's history or history like this. And I say, you know, you should probably mention it, partly because I write a daily column about race, which I mention constantly, and I'm always looking for new material. But you have to talk about it because this is the reason why there isn't a legacy of park rangers of color, of conservationists, of um, fly shop owners, of hikers, and people of all colors refreshing their spirits and enjoying the day the lords and the taxpayers made. That's your pipeline problem, you have to mention it. So if one of the things I've learned in the last three years establishing the race beat at Fortune is that racism runs so deep and it's baked so profoundly into everything we see and we do and that we think that it's almost impossible to see the bottom and that makes it almost impossible to see each other and which makes the work that you do, I know, in your lives, both professionally and personally, and that I'm hoping that we're gonna do here today, so important. The individual work of recognizing and managing our blind spots is so vital. It is a skill that helps us to be more open to the often troubling aspects of our own behavior that we simply can't see, but most importantly, to understand the traditional dynamics of power that have been invisible to us. It makes us happier, better at work, and better allies to each other. So our goal today is a lofty one, and my sisters at NextGen back at Fortune HQ have spent a long time on this, and we're really excited. We want to address today in our town hall the real pain points that you're feeling, not the proof points. We know that diversity, um, is the case for business case for diversity is real, but what you're actually experiencing in yourselves, what you're worried about in your teams, and figure out ways that we can pull together actual tactics, real ideas that we can we, we can um, chronicle here in some form. You'll get a report, maybe it'll be a Google Doc. We've got reporters everywhere. We're gonna figure this out and maybe get on the Nobel Prize winning track of helping us to see each other more effectively than we have before. So we can all agree that the business case for diversity has been made. Yep. Can we all agree that we have felt alone or lonely ourselves at work at some time? Or that we're worried about other people who do? We can all agree that you wanna go fishing with me someday? <laughs> Some will work on that maybe. 
So um, to get us started, we have three extraordinary experts who have been such a treasure to me in my life and also to the work that Race Ahead has been able to do in the last few years. And I want to begin um, with Katrina Jones. I see, I see you. I see you. I see you. Um, you have given me data and stories, personal and professional, over the years that have really highlighted these issues. And I wanted to thank you and acknowledge you for that. You're the head of diversity and inclusion at Twitch, but that even barely um, touches on what you've been doing. So Katrina, based on what we've been talking about now and my nice long setup, where would you like to jump in? I would like to jump in and, and thank you for this opportunity, for this moment. Um, First, by asking everybody in this room to really fully be present and be here so that we can really dive deep and uncover and start to talk about those ways in which we are prevented from showing up at work and sharing our full selves and being our full selves and the ways that we feel penalized when we do. So for me, the I work in the DNI field and I have worked in HR before that and the majority of my coworkers have been women, um, predominantly white women. And it's been an interesting experience because although at times we have bonded by the sisterhood of being a woman, uh, occasionally of being a parent, of, of having a family, one thing that has existed as a divide and that for me has made me feel disconnected is that I have felt not felt like I could bring my race and the experiences that I have as a result of being a black woman in America forward. It's There's this thing that happens with when you tell someone about an experience you have where, for example, someone um, approaches you and thinks that you are working in the back and washing dishes. And nothing is wrong with that, right? But I am a professional woman. Um, or if I am nervous because my neighbors repeatedly question my stepson about a missing glove and go so far as to ask to look in the garage or in the house because they can't find the glove and it has to be with him. And I worry about my black stepson going around the neighborhood at night and God forbids walking into someone's yard and someone mistaking him for a burglar or someone that's intending to do them harm. And I have not felt like I could bring that to work without being questioned, without people trying to explain away the experiences that I have and casting doubt on who I am and my perspective. And that's painful because this is a sisterhood. Yes. So how do we get people to break down that bias? What is that thing that challenges, makes you want to challenge someone when they say, hey, this thing happened to me and I feel scared, I feel nervous as a parent? What is that thing that makes you stop and, or, and question or somehow disconnect from that person in that moment. So Layla, can we bring you in now? Layla Seika, the Executive Vice President at Exchange at Salesforce. You, this audience knows you best for your star turn in tackling the gender gap, pay gap at Salesforce, but you have a different experience that's very related to this. Sure. So three years ago, my friend Cindy Robbins and I went to our CEO and told him the women weren't being paid the same as the men. Uh, that has led to north of $9 million over the last three years fixing the pay inequities at Salesforce. <laughs> um, thanks. Uh, it changed our entire company. It changed all of technology. Um, and I was feeling pretty good about myself, right? I got a lot of emails from people, thanks for the raise, I can pay for things. Um, and we hired a chief equality officer named Tony Profit, and Tony asked me to be the executive sponsor of Bold Force, which is our black employee resource group, which Leah started, she's sitting next to me. Um, and when he asked me to do that, I wrote, I love him, I wrote him a note back and I was like, hey, you know, that's cool, but maybe I should be the exec sponsor of the women's group, right? Because I'm a woman. 
and I'm not black, so I, you know, and he was like, no, no, we talked about this. We want you to be the exec sponsor of Bold for us. So I said, okay, I'll do what it takes. So I sat down for six months and I listened to as many black employees at Salesforce as I could. And I tried to understand what it feels like to be a black person at Salesforce, what it feels like to be a black person in technology, what it feels like to be a black person in America, what it just feels like. And I tried really hard to understand this. And as soon as I started understanding it, I have a loud voice and I started using that voice to advocate. Um, and one of the things I did is I brought this up in executive meetings. So I would talk about the black employees, the black employees this, we should think about this. Um, and, and you know, it, let me be clear that black is the self-identified word that Bold Force chose to use and I discussed it with them. I said, can I use black? Should I say African American? What word should I use? And they said, no, black, that's the word we've decided on. So I stood at exec meetings and I said, black employees need this, we need to think about what we put in the fridge, we need to think about how we organize the office. Um, and you know, we had good talk and then on the way to the bathroom, and these are good people, right? Let me be clear, they just grew up in white neighborhoods and went to white schools and only saw white people. I grew up in Berkeley, everyone I saw looked different, so I had a different experience. <laughs> but I'd be going to the bathroom after some of these conversations and they'd be like, Layla, you can't say black. And I was like, I mean, my question to you is, how are we going to change anything if we don't have a vocabulary with which we can all discuss it, right? Um, and the next thing I would say is, you know, I had a lot of white privilege, right? I had a lot of white privilege in the moment when I did equal pay. I was feeling really good about that white privilege. But when I actually stuck my head up and looked, I was talking to a lot of white women, Right, so I mean my question to all of you is, how many black women have you mentored or helped rise up? How many are you like actively trying to talk to, engage with? Uh, it's not a white woman's sport, right? It's, it's not a white sport, it's just we gotta do this for everyone. And Equal Pay was a great example of how you can use your voice to change things. Now I'm using my voice to try to change this. Beautiful. So before we run to Carla, this is the world's like least relevant follow-up question, but how do you set up um, refrigerators for black people? No, 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 what's <laughs> in the refrigerator? Like just oh. food and like all this, you oh. know, just how you I'm set so up glad the I workplace. Asked. Yeah, no, not refrigerators, no, no, I mean like, What's in there? What does it feel like when you walk in the building? What okay. does it feel like? Do you, do you see yourself on the wall in the pictures? Do you feel like you belong there? As a white woman, all I paid attention to was how many men were in the pictures for a long time. Yeah, I still pay attention to that and it's annoying, but I spend a lot more time paying attention to how many white people are in the pictures now. All right, very good. Carla Monterosso, the still kind of newish CEO of Code 2040. Six months in. So what have you learned about taking the reins of power? <laughs> <laughs> um, so when Ellen asked me to talk about this, um, I thought a lot about a trip I took to Guatemala to see my family last year. My family lives in um, a little town in Isabal, which is like in the middle of the jungle. And my uncle had been talking to me about these very salacious details of our very embarrassing American presidential election. And like, I have family there, and I could not have told you details about a Guatemalan election <laughs> to save my life. Um, and I asked him, I said, Theo, like, how do you know all this stuff? And he said, mija, because what impacts, you, what impacts you over there impacts us over here. And I've always been a real passionate voter, <laughs> um, but it did not occur to me until that moment that my vote wasn't just for me, that it was also for him. And that my uncle understood what it was like to not have any say in the power that controls you, because that is the story of America with Guatemala. And the biggest difference as I stepped into the executive role and to being the CEO especially, is I have noticed that power operates the very same. And Sometimes you've spent so much time with the lack of systemic power and using all of those tools that we've been talking about to disarm the people around you into liking your ideas and making people think that your idea is their idea and doing a hundred things to navigate a world that systemically is like locking you out, that you actually don't notice the very moment in which you have gotten institutional power. And that all of a sudden, you get to dictate and push on processes and policies. 
And like my hope for us today in this town hall, right, is like, I am in my capacity as CEO of Co2040, I've seen amazing things happen. I watched one of our alums, a young woman, like push her company to let her do the AI around radiology in the African continent because there's such a poor ratio of radiologists to women there that breast cancer is proliferating and killing people. And she is working on the tech that is going to stop that from happening. I had, <laughs> this year used an app that one of our alums created, Kaya Thomas, called the We Read 2 app that, um, has all of the protagonists of color in children's stories uh, are people of color on that app. So you can find a hero in any community on the We Read 2 app. And that was never more potent to me than having had a one-year-old niece this year and watching her carry around um, Sonia Sotomayor, a jug grows in Brooklyn like it's an appendage. <laughs> and I was 19 before I ever saw a protagonist of color in a book. And I have Kaya Thomas to thank for that, that my, my niece is going to grow up in a world where that's never going to be her reality. And we could create that world like we really could, but this has got to stop being about proving that this is a problem mm. and that this is a feelings problem. Um, this, is a, this is a problem about power, who has it, who doesn't, how we choose to distribute or not distribute it, and about risk and who we ask to incur it, and who we assume should incur it, and the systems, policies, analysis, operations, and management that keep power in the hands of a few and distribute risk into the underrepresented many. And so my hope for our conversation today is that we are going to talk about those policies, operations, systems, change management, and management that allow us to move this from like a conversation where we're proving our voices to using our power to distribute it to the women that don't get to be in this room. Very good. Very good. So. Our planet turns as lonely eyes to all of you. What, what is resonating with you? What do you need to know? What, are, what's, what's, what is hitting your ear? What is a pain point for you? Hi, right down here in front. Where is, the mic is coming. Here she comes. Okay, I don't know how this works, if it's more of a request or thoughts, but this is both. Tell us your name. Oh, I'm Claire, Claire. Tilke, um, Chief Operating Officer. Of it's our Heinz town hall. Investment. We can do whatever we want. Ah, of Heinz Investment Management. Um, so one thing that's been jumping out, I think, in this conversation and then the conversations over lunch and through last night is there's such a dynamism around the major issues here. So many of us here are the first or the onlys in our day job, and then we come here for a day and a half and gather so many ideas and get so much energy around change, uh, but then we all go back to those day jobs and hopefully come again next year. And so the, the question is, how can we create something that's ongoing with this group, whether it's peer support um, or accountability partners around some of the things that we're so jazzed about right now right. and still have that same energy right. and, again, accountability in three months, six months, nine months. Like, we're also action-oriented, so how do we help each other do it? So you really want to create a mechanism for next We year? all need more to do, so... <laughs> You're welcome. That's my idea. <laughs> How do we do that? I would love that. Any ideas? Hi. Right, yes, right here. Hi, the Vera Shok, Salesforce. Um, I was just talking to a few people out here saying we wanted to start Fortune MPW Bay Area. We were thinking of a Facebook group to start with and a quarterly meeting because, like you said, we're actionable. And I'm a PM. I like to prioritize and backlog things. <laughs> so, so we were thinking about a quarterly meeting. But if we want to have a larger group, let's do it. <laughs> well, I think I've just lost control of the conference. <laughs> OK, so um, quarterly meeting, starting with the Facebook group. Any other tactics to keep together? Is there, should we have a running list of what our collective goals are? This is not where I thought this was going. And I love it. I love anywhere you'd want to go. 
Yes, hi. Hi, I'm Christy Bertolo from The Ohio State University. Um, but I think one thing, too, to add on that is um, I'm not from the Bay Area. Um, and there are a lot of us um, all over the US that you know we're trying to um, grow the momentum for women and to continue to empower each other. Um, so how do we how do we spread that love um, when when you're not in these different um, demographical um, areas? So um, I love the idea of um, the Bay Area um, MPW. Not sure I would be able to make it out here very often, but I um, would love to see how we could really um, grow and engage that conversation. So it sounds like the possibility for regional meetups just to be in touch, but um, a bigger mechanism to talk about the things that really matter to you and maybe some best practices to spread the MPW joy and people around you. So that would be personally and professionally. So what would be, uh, I've got experts here, what are some of the best practices that we can all do starting tomorrow when we go, when we go back to our day lives and, and to make a difference in the, and to see the people around us? Is there a trick where we can begin to find, to identify the people who need us and we haven't been paying attention to before? Hi, Erin Papworth. We have a startup um, called Navit that's trying to increase financial literacy amongst women because I fundamentally believe that that is the next generation. We are all here in this room and have access to our own personal money for the first time and that's really where you can fund power in a lot of ways. So one of the things we suggest to um, women leaders is look at your team and look at if you are also promoting equal pay. So look at who you have direct subordinates and talk about, you know, are you, are you funding them and are you giving the opportunities that they deserve? So would an add-on to this, I'm curious about this, would that be finding people in your um, area, in your team, who may not be able to afford the kinds of things that other, can, other people can, like professional sponsorships or travel for a personal development that's not covered by work? Because I, you know, I, I worry that there's some younger folks or just people from different backgrounds who just aren't, you do, you're not even thinking about that they can't do what you do. Would be awareness of that be part of that? Yes, I think it's a broader conversation of what are you evaluating people on. I think there was a woman from Microsoft yesterday that that said, were you guys in that, where she said that she realized she wasn't being evaluated on her strengths, and she went to her boss and said, hey, you know, what I'm being evaluated on is very masculine, and I have these traits that I'm bringing, and can you do something about it? And then he went and fought for her. So I think, and that, that's in terms of valuation, but equal pay is really, I mean, women lose half a million to a million dollars over their lifetime okay. by not negotiating their salary, not being paid what, they're, what they deserve. So it's kind of the baseline of, you know, how are, we, how are we investing in the collective women that we now have a little bit of responsibility and control to help. Thank you, I love that. Hi, down here, hello. Um, Tabitha Gomez, Stanley Black & Decker. Um, one of the things I think we haven't talked a lot about today was unconscious bias. We've talked a lot about diversity and inclusion, but we haven't talked about that. And I do believe us, even as women in leadership roles, we have them as well. And I learned something really great from a colleague from Target um, about two months ago, and she told me, hey, when they're training us on those things, one of the things they say is, we're not responsible for our first thought, but we're accountable for our second thought and our action. And that stuck with me, and I've taken it to work and told that to my peers, told that to my teams, and brought it there, right? Because yeah, sometimes you can't control the first thing that comes to your mind, but you can control how you address that thought and then how you act towards others. And if we can do it as leading by example, I think we can get more people in our organizations to do that as well. So we can operate both as hot shots and someone who's learned to take a pause to really weigh in on their second thought. Correct. All right, I love that. You guys are geniuses, I knew it. Hi, uh, Archana with the Sheryl Sandberg Foundation, so you may know what's coming up next. Um, <laughs> but I, you know, I've, I've only been with the foundation for a couple of months, um, but there's a lot of research that shows the power of small groups of women coming together. We call them lean in circles. You don't have to use the circle methodology, and you don't even have to use the content on the website, although it is excellent. Um, but I think there is something to the discipline of convening in small groups and holding each other accountable, which is a couple of things that I've heard. Um, and using that, you know, if you're the most 
senior person in the room. It doesn't have to be with just your peers, but really using that mechanism to lift up more junior folks within your organization. So if you don't have lean in circles or some kind of mechanism within your company, I would really encourage you to look into that. Um, and you could also, we should, we should do a fortune MPW lean in circle community, which I'm happy to help us <laughs> start uh, you. if you would like just to get more connectivity across the different regions um, Lux brought before. Thanks. So we're going to embrace that power of the small, small groups of gatherings. We've got one here, and then we've got Bari coming up next. Thank you very much. Hi, my name's Heidi Williams, and I'm co-founder and CTO of Techwitable. We're building a platform to address bias, discrimination, and harassment in the workplace. So number one, you can all buy our software. But more <laughs> importantly, um, what I really wanted to say Do you is- you have discounts? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, for all of you. Um, so one of the things I wanted to say on, on a couple different points, like one, how can we help more people get the language to be able to have a conversation comfortably about race? Or how we are all busy. How can we engage other people so we're not paying the tax of doing more to have ourselves rise up. And one thing that I have found super valuable is actually um, uh, reading Race Ahead every day and Broadsheet every day. And what if we all go back and sign up 10 white men to read those and get familiar with the language and the things that are actually happening to people. If you don't work with someone that's black, read Race Ahead and you will hear lots of stories of things that you may have never imagined happen, but it's an amazing way to get educated. So if we all promise to go out and get 10, 15, 20 people to go get educated and raise awareness, I think that would go a long way. I love that idea, obviously. If you could hashtag it up on Instagram, read Race Ahead as they're signing up, that would be even better. And Broadsheet, we need more men reading the Broadsheet. Thank you for that. Hi, Bari. Hi, Ellen. Um, <laughs> So I would say, first off, Bari Williams, I am over legal and policy at All Turtles, which is an AI incubator. Um, one thing I would say, uh, uh, the woman who was speaking to having the startup about financial literacy, it jogged something in my mind, is that uh, oftentimes we take for granted um, an employee's ability to pay for things. Yeah. Like, you have no idea how good my credit is or isn't. Right. So you asking me to put something on a credit card and then you'll reimburse me, I know. you have no idea what I'm doing with that money. I may need to pay for something for a family member. I may be over leveraged already. Right. I may be behind a payment. I don't need you to have me further behind. Right. This is not really my personal credit story. But, <laughs> <laughs> but it is the story of some employees that I've heard before and oftentimes they're women of color and that's because we're acting as take, uh, caretakers in other facets of our lives for other people. And people take for granted the notion that just, oh, everyone has a credit card and you might have multiple credit cards and you can just put something on your credit card and get reimbursed. No, companies should be proactive. If you want me to attend something, you pay for it. If you want me to go somewhere, you sponsor it. You figure out how to pay for it. Yeah. It shouldn't be on the employee to have to also take on the financial burden to make themselves a better employee. That's the point of the company. So would, um, so would a great best practice for us to, as a group, advocate for in our lives eventually? I don't think we should come up with a list of like 50 things and like do it all at once. So would that be a, a, a recommendation for an inclusive financial practice that we can decide to advocate for as, as the new group that's taking over the world? Yes. Yes. Thank you. We've got two down here. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm Melissa Tidwell. I'm the Vice President General Counsel at Reddit. Um, I'm one of the very few, I think, black females who, who sit um, at the executive table. And I think two things are, are really critical, I think, especially as being sort of one person that's fear. One of which is, is I think there's always the expectation as the person in that world that, that I have to speak up for the black people, so I salute you for, <laughs> for also being at that table, it right? Because you, you can't solve that, I can't solve all of those problems, right? And I think it's, it's super important that, that at the executive level, you force the conversation, right? So I don't always raise the black issue. I, I rely on my sales colleague who raises Muslim issues and sort of what do we think about that? I rely on, you know, my, um, you know, my lesbian colleague who talks about those issues, and, and I'll bring him up if she doesn't, right? And so I think it's really important that wherever you sit in the chain, that you actually just fundamentally ask the question, like, and not rely on the minorities in the room to sort of raise the issue. Because very often, in particular in tech, you stop with women. So it's where are we with women in engineering? Where are we with women as a, as a whole company? And you don't get to the, to the further, you know, the further intersectional, intersectionality that I think is really critical to making people feel comfortable. And I, the other thing is, is that, and I don't not have this gene, but I, I think you do have to stand up and say the hard things that need to be said, right? I am the person that said to my CEO, like, this is what white privilege is, <laughs> watch a video. 
<laughs> and so I think it is, you know, it, it, you, you have to be able to have a real conversation. You have to be able to listen to others, even if you fundamentally disagree with where they come from. And I think we fail a lot in, in actually being able to do that. Thank you. Hi, Jimena Almendares. Uh, I work for Intuit. I'm the VP of Global Expansion, CEO and President of Intuit Payments, too. I have first an idea and then almost a prompt. The first idea is I am also the executive sponsor for the Latinos at Intuit. And I realized that at first we were doing mainly social networking and it was great, but also we do a lot of follow me homes that inform what the product will look like for all of the world. So what I did was recruiting some of the Latinos that knew in their community, so they're entrepreneurs. So what I'm trying to do with Intuit is that for every follow me home that we do, there's another one that it's a diversity business so that all of the decisions that we're making are not just based based on the uh, consultants around the world, but it's also the small Latino businesses, the small black businesses, because they have very specific needs. So that's just a thought of something that we're doing where we can leverage and increase the voice of diversity employees so that we can shape products and then help communities. The other one, though, is a prompt. When I was at MIT, I started, Prop 8 was happening. There were a lot of suicides in the LGBTQ community. Mm -hmm. And what I realized was that it also was starting because professors didn't know how to talk about LGBTQ issues. And there were a lot of students that were just didn't know how to bring up the issue, even if they were considering a gender transition. So what we did was a, a You Are Welcome Here campaign, where we basically spread a frequently asked questions uh, pamphlet really of information to 20,000 professors and students so that at least they knew that if the subject was coming up and they were a professor perhaps from, from another country where the subject was not even something they were even aware or didn't know how to talk about, they would at least have a place where to start or, or websites where they could talk about things. Now I would want to think about what would that mean for diversity? As an example, I'm Mexican, so I can really empathize with what Latino communities uh, have, and there's so much related to your families. Oftentimes, we need to pay for parents, and it's not just Mexicans. Uh, people that are immigrants often have families in different places, and they need to take care of them. The problem is that you don't really have a space. You cannot go to the office and be like, I'm really worried because I need to pay for my parents' doctor somewhere, and it's just like that sense of isolation. So I wonder if anyone has ever thought about what might that repository of information could look like? Because not all of us need to be Mexicans or Latinos to even have that conversation where you have someone in your team and you can open the door to say, hey, we understand that there might be different situations. You talked about the credit history, but just like how do we create a space where at least there's that place where you can talk about things and then that might decrease the sense of isolation. Any suggestions? And we've got another uh, question down here. If not, then we can come back. Yes, Carla. And then down here. So I've seen a lot of the misuse of ERGs. Um, to, oh, that's interesting. To do the labor of the diversity work versus being a play. <laughs> like you need to. We need to invest like money and and power capital from the top in, in the to to do the work. And the ERG can be a place in which people can come and find support for the life stories and situations that they are experiencing and getting the professional development that they need. And then those people will walk into the world being better employees. Mm -hmm. um, but I think our constant use of those ERGs to substitute for actual investments in diversities is hurting a lot of movement building. So is there, to build on this idea that you don't know how people are suffering, which is interesting, and then we've got a question here and then here, is there an effective way for an individual that's not part of an organized group or in a leadership position to ask for good survey information or to query the, the survey information that you have just so you can begin to identify who is vulnerable and who needs you, who's not you, and then you can take a breath and then not have your first impulse be to protect yourself but to, to, to advocate for somebody else? Is there a good way to develop this data or to ask this question? Maybe if, if we can't figure that out now, maybe you could just ping me later. And because that seems like that would be the good best practice as an individual to identify who needs them. And we've got, oh, I think it was, was it down here first? No, that was it. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. Um, yeah, I was actually going to, my name is Jennifer. I work at Facebook. Um, we have lots of data. Um, I know you do. <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, I actually wasn't going to address that, although I have a lot of thoughts on that because I lead a diversity initiative within the pillar in which I work at Facebook and I set one up for the AI team that I led for a year and um, which is was fascinating because I um, have never been so outnumbered in my entire career. So it's been incredibly satisfying to do this at Facebook because they have good frameworks for these things. But one thing that um, I absolutely insist on, and I would encourage anyone who's working in this area to do this, is if you are going to start diversity initiatives, you have to insist that whoever is in the most significant place in power in the organization attends, and attends religiously. Um, and I have- you had good luck with that? I have, actually. I mean, I'm pretty forceful, but um, it, it is, we, so we've done um, a few things. And the other thing that we've done is set up a structured mentorship and sponsorship program, which is designed to give people who feel like they don't have a voice, a voice in rooms where they're not invited, generally. So rather than this being like uh, top down, let me tell you as a person with 20 more years experience than you how to run your career, it's very much about me or my peers listening to people who don't have the kind of access that we have and throwing their ideas up the chain. So that's been tremendously satisfying and I think super effective for everybody. So I have, a, I have lots of thoughts on diversity. If you're trying to set something up within your org, um, come find me. Are you going to be part of our big group? Yeah, I'll be part of the big group. I also live in the Bay Area. And one other comment, I'm so happy to be here with people from other industries because um, it, <laughs> I think that, especially in Silicon Valley, it can feel like uh, we have sort of outweighed influence, especially these days. But being a woman in Silicon Valley is weird. And it's been a long time since I've been outside Silicon Valley. It's really, really nice to see people from other industries holding their confidence and power in different ways than we sometimes are able to there. Beautiful, beautiful. Thank you for your patience. Yeah. Hi, everybody. I'm back. Um, <laughs> I, I wanted to bring this back to talk about what we do socially. Um, so our our schools are segregated, our communities are segregated. We are segregated in where we live in our neighborhoods. Um, we are, our children usually attend schools that are not diverse um, because if they are diverse, they're likely not great schools. And if they are more homogenous, they're likely well-performing schools, right? Um, and it's that's a whole other discussion about how, how to bridge that gap. but. Socially, because we are living separately and we don't um, have friends maybe who don't look like us or have a lot of friends who look like us, we don't understand other people's experiences, right? So, for example, I uh, was with a colleague and she, we were on a trip and she was going to go get her hair done at one of those blow-dry bars. And this was around the time that they had just started popping up, right? Um, and she was excited. She was like, oh, you should come with me. We'll go get our hair done. And I was like, mm, no, 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 I'm not, not going to. I'll be at the hotel. It's fine. <laughs> because I can't go and walk into just any salon and assume that there will be someone right. who knows how to do my hair or that right. they'll have the proper products, et cetera. I, I have lots of experience that has told me don't do it. Don't do it. All right. um, so, but that's something that she w did not know and would not have known unless we had had that moment to talk about it and unless, you know, maybe she'd come with me to, when I go get my hair done. Um, but that lack of, of social connection, that lack of like actually being part of the everyday mundane people, I think is what keeps us from really understanding how other people are living and the challenges that they face. The sweet mundane. So our group is going to look for ways that we can get to know each other better. We've got about a minute left. Yeah, hi everyone. I'm Rashida Hodge from IBM. I head our Watson Strategic Partnerships. So I think a constant theme for me being here over the last day or so is around cultivating relationships and how cultivating relationships really help open up opportunities. And I think one of the things that we've got to be sensitive to, especially with the Me Too movement, is that, you know, men and, you know, sometimes others that, you know, 
probably are not in this contingency are sensitive to the climate and the conversation. And I think, you know, we have to make sure that we let men and others know that, you know, we need, they need to cultivate those relationships that are informal but respectful. Because it's through those informal relationships that create um, opportunities are created. We really open and bust down boundaries that are there. And I think we've got to be able to hold those accountable. So we put a lot of pressure on ourselves. Let's do more. Let's have more groups. And all of those things are great. But I think we also have to make sure that we're also bringing other people in. Just like, you know, Lindsay, you said from a Salesforce perspective, you know, I am the executive sponsor of the black group. That's great, right? Uh, we don't need to make sure that, you know, it's always the woman or it's always the black person. And we've got to hold those individuals accountable and bring them in and help them to be able to build those cultivating and informal relationships that are respectful. And that is the great way to end. How did you feel about how the town hall went? <laughs>